Hello and welcome to eBible Fellowship's Evening Bible Studies with your speaker, Chris McCann. If you'd like more information or to hear more studies, visit our website at www.ebiblefellowship.com. And now, with your evening Bible study, here's Chris McCann. Good evening and welcome to eBible Fellowship's Bible Study in the Book of Revelation. Tonight is study number 44 of Revelation chapter 14. And we're continuing to look into verse 15. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And we've been looking at what the Bible has to say in other places concerning harvest. We saw that God speaks of harvest as a time for his wise sons to work. God points to the ant and says, Be wise, consider her ways. She gathers her food in summer and in harvest. It says in Proverbs chapter 6, On the other hand, a son that sleeps in harvest causes shame. And also in Proverbs 6, where the Lord is pointing to the ant, he Uh, strongly emphasizes that uh, the sluggard needs to awake. The sluggard um, is not to sleep. To sleep brings poverty, and poverty is destruction. And and so God is indicating that um, the time of harvest, which is a time to reap, is a time in which the wise will work. And what will be the work that they perform, or what is their task? To perform the role of reaper. I have sent you to reap. We read in John 4.38, as Christ is speaking to his disciples, who are representing the elect people of God, I sent you to reap. Well, we um, went to First Thessalonians chapter 5 in following the idea of sleeping in harvest or sleeping at the time of Christ's coming in Judgment Day. And we read in verses 6 and 7, Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep sleep in the night, And they that be drunken are drunken in the night. And this reminds us of the end of the 12-hour workday, as the 12-hour day points to the day of salvation in which men are to work, or, more particularly, Christ performs the work of salvation. But then the night comes, we read in John 9, in which no man can work. Christ will not perform the work of salvation. Because the time of sowing the seed in order that people might hear and become saved has ended. Now the night comes. And the night is related to to harvest, to judgment day. A time that God warns against sleeping. And, And so they that sleep, sleep in the night. And they that be drunken are drunken in the night. Now, we looked at sleep, and uh, let, let's just take a, a little look at some scripture where God speaks of drunkenness in connection with Judgment Day. For instance, in Luke 21, which is a chapter, a parallel chapter to Matthew 24, in which the Lord answers the disciples' question, What shall be the sign of thy coming? of the end of the world, we read in Luke 21, 34, And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life, and so that day come upon you unawares. The word unawares is the same Greek word translated as suddenly or, or sudden in First Thessalonians 5. 
uh, uh, when they say peace and safety, there will be sudden destruction, unawares destruction, or literally this word means not seen. It, and, and that perfectly describes a spiritual judgment. It is a destruction not seen. And, and that's exactly what God has in mind here. Any who are involved with drunkenness, well, they will be caught by the unseen or not seen judgment of God when he shuts the door of heaven and they, they don't see that because it's a spiritual door. None could see while it was open. None can see now that it's closed. And this is the problem with man. He doesn't see something with his eyes, so he assumes there's nothing there. And yet God's whole kingdom is a spiritual kingdom. God himself is spirit. And, and, and God speaks of seeing with the eyes of faith with spiritual sight and uh, that's why the people of God understood when judgment began at the house of God they could see Satan standing in the holy place as the abomination of desolation they could see Satan taking his seat as the man of sin not literally or physically. No one could see Satan. He's a spirit being. But through the eyes of faith, through the eyes that Christ gives to his people, God's elect could see that the house of God was under the judgment of God. But uh, those in the churches who were not his elect, the tares could not see this. They, they were perplexed and and disturbed by this kind of talk that the church age was over, that God's wrath was upon them, that Satan had entered in and the Spirit of God had entered out. They looked around. They saw the same pastor that had been there maybe for 20 years. They saw a good-sized congregation, a vibrant church. They, they saw they still had the Bible. They, they were still singing hymns with uh, with fervor. They, they were praying diligently. What's the problem? They could not see the spiritual judgment that came upon them. Now, if the church where God um, uh, had his word and, and, and they're fully aware that Christ speaks in parables, they're fully aware of the spiritual nature of the word of God, and, and if they could not see spiritually the judgment of God upon them, why would anyone think that the world in, in which they uh, deny the Bible, they, they don't want anything to do with the Bible, they live uh, as a, a doctrine by sight, they, they believe what they can see and feel and touch, they believe their senses, why would anyone think that they would be able to discern a judgment come upon them when God said it would on May 21, 2011? Well, no, of course we shouldn't expect the people of the world to be able to see spiritually the judgment upon them, but the, the true believers can see. And yet there were many that join forces with true believers. And, and God um, allows this because it serves to accomplish his purpose. At the time, in the days leading up to um, May 21, 2011, God was busy with, with the great task of warning the whole world and saving the last of his elect. And, and so he uses the unsaved for various purposes to to fulfill his word for instance he used the news media to uh, widen the the sending forth of the message even though mostly they were negative yet they they were used by God to get the word out to uh, an even greater distance and and even a further reach and 
Also, God used unsaved professed believers, and we'd have to say a good number of them. We don't know the numbers uh, exactly, but just uh, considering how so many have fallen away since, we would have to say there was a good number of people that joined up for whatever reason. They, they were attracted by the idea of knowing the, the time of the end, or they were attracted by the idea of the end of the church age and sort of being on their own. And in order to go along with that, they, they went along with this other time information also. Whatever the reason, there, there could have been many reasons for various people, but they were not saved. And, and so when the time came, it, it, as God used them to hand out tracts, and God could have had them on mission trips, or they could have done it locally. Uh, God could have used their financial resources. God could have used them in, in a good number of ways to accomplish his purposes. And then when the day came, and, and uh, there was nothing that happened, apparently, well, they reacted angrily. Uh, more and more of them, they, they reacted bitterly. They, they reacted in a way that God's elect do not react by getting angry at the whole topic and, and, and feeling so frustrated that they turn their back on scripture that indicates that was the day. Oh, they didn't want to talk about it anymore. They certainly didn't want to discuss looking into it any further. They've had enough. That's it. No more. Uh, I, no man knows a day or hour. I'll, I'll accept that now. I'm going um, to reject the timeline. I'm going to reject the date. I'm going to reject many of the doctrines that I previously held. Well, God's people don't do that. The Lord's people, when tried, and we were tried as others, God's people, when confused, and we were confused as others, wait on the Lord. They wait on the Word of God. They wait, searching the Scriptures, praying for wisdom, even at the time when the world is reviling them, the church is rejoicing over them. Their fellow believers that were with them are turned against them, denouncing them, denouncing the, the very doctrine that the people, that God's true people, the elect, are waiting on, yet the true child of God could not turn his back on these things because he knows I heard the voice of Christ. And harmony in the Bible, when we use God's methodology of comparing the scripture and come to harmonious conclusions, are not to be rejected, but they, they must be, uh, in, in those circumstances, searched out further. What did God do? Why didn't it happen? And the true believer continues in the word or continues abiding in the doctrine of Christ. Where the unsaved, the unregenerate the, the uh, heart that uh, uh, is within a professed believer doesn't find that necessary. And it's enough for him or her that I didn't see anything. That's it. And, and they reject the word of God. And that's the test. The, the child of God waits on the Lord. And those that rejected uh, due to what their eyes, they think, were able to perceive, they are failing the test. Well, and, and, and this is all involved with spiritual drunkenness. In Luke 12, in Luke 12, it says in verses 45 and 46, But and if that servant, that servant say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to beat the men servants and maidens, 
and to eat and drink and to be drunken. The Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him, and at an hour when he is not aware, and will cut him in sunder and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. Now, now notice here that God is speaking of a servant that says in his heart. So this is a very uh, intimate, personal thing. It might even be someone who, who, who wouldn't say this out loud, but in their heart they have decided, my Lord delayeth his coming. And as a result, they now take a position contrary to the truth, contrary to the true believers that hold to the truth. And this is the equivalent of beating the men's servants and meetings and eating and drinking and to be drunken with the rest of the unsaved people. That they've joined hands with the church or they've joined hands with the world. And, and now they'll stand with them. They've learned their lesson. Oh, this is where the power is, they think. This is where the strength is to be on the side of the ones who can just bide their time until the date passes and then point the finger and say false prophet and they can uh, revile and, and um, they, they can feel very proud about themselves. They were right. They were correct. Of course, it takes nothing uh, to do that. It's um, the world's natural position to be in disbelief. The church's natural position in this fallen apostate church to doubt the, the true teachings of the Bible. And now for uh, these servants who were once uh, hand in hand, it seemed, with the true believers, they join with them. And now they're hand in hand with those. And they're already all prepared to, uh, to naysay or, or to gainsay and, and to be the skeptic uh, where uh, they, they felt they should have been now because the skeptic uh, seemed so powerful to them after May 21, 2011. Well, notice that the servant says in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming. And that reminds us of something we read in the Old Testament. In the book of Exodus, we find that God severely tried the Israelites that had come out of Egypt. That, that great deliverance where all Israel, not one single Jew, was left behind. All Israel were delivered out of the bondage of the iron furnace of Egypt and they came forth with a great deliverance. And we see the, the parallel um, with May 21, 2011 as the Bible teaches that God saved the great multitude out of great tribulation and therefore all spiritual Israel by that point had been delivered out of this world or out of Satan's kingdom of darkness as, as Pharaoh of Egypt typifies Satan and God delivered spiritually all spiritual Israel not leaving one spiritual Israelite spiritual Jew behind in Satan's kingdom. And what happened historically after all Israel was delivered with that great deliverance out of Egypt. Did they come out of the gates of Egypt and all was wonderful, all was well and joyful, and they marched right into the promised land? No, no. I'm sure many of those Jews had um, expectations along those kind of lines. Everything is going to be super wonderful now. We're no longer a slave. And, and yet, what did God have in store for them? A severe trial. They came out, and it wasn't long that they were tested with the Egyptian army following after them. And, and then God made a way 
uh, uh, in crossing the Red Sea. Then they were tested with thirst and tested with hunger. And it was test after test after test. God um, told them to send spies into the promised land. And the spies came back with an evil report. After searching the land for 40 days, uh, all the spies except for Joshua and Caleb uh, were too afraid of the inhabitants of the land and, and said, it's too much for us. We cannot overcome. And, and as a result of their evil report, God judged Israel and said, you will wander in this wilderness for 40 years and until the evil generation die out and their carcasses fall in the wilderness. And, and so that whole period of wilderness sojourning was a 40-year period and 40 points to testing. And within that 40 years, Moses went up to the mount to receive the Ten Commandments for 40 days and 40 nights. And not only that, he didn't do that one time, but two times. And here in Exodus 24 is the first time where we read in verse 18, And Moses went into the midst of the cloud and got him up into the mount. And Moses was in the mount 40 days and 40 nights. A, a time of testing. And Israel was left at the base of the mount. And, and they were being tried, although I'm sure they weren't aware of it. Yet God was watching them. God was observing. How will they react? And apparently Moses tarried or, or Moses did not know and therefore Israel did not know how long Moses was to be in the mount or maybe Moses didn't tell them. But, but they felt that it had passed the time. And we read in Exodus 32 verse 1, and when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods, which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we wot not what has become of him. And then it says in Exodus 32 in verses 5 and 6, And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to Jehovah. And they rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. After their great deliverance, they were tested and they failed the test. They began to eat and to drink and to play. And... And then we, we know that God wanted to destroy them, but Moses interceded. And, and again, we can see a tie-in with these days after the tribulation, which ended on May 21, 2011. The 23-year Great Tribulation came to a close then. With the number 1,600 days, which is the probable duration of Judgment Day, these days, again after the Tribulation, as 1600 breaks down to 40 times 40. And throughout this period of time, from the very beginning, right after May 21, on, on the next day, God began to try all who profess to be believers especially outside of the churches and congregations. He, he's not trying those within the church at this time. They had their period of trial during the Great Tribulation. And when they failed to come out of the church, they failed their test. And, and then God brought the judgment upon them at the very beginning of Judgment Day as they were all bundled as tares for the burning. But for all those that came out of the church or for the great multitude saved outside of the congregations. God also had a testing program for us in putting the fire to us, a spiritual flame 
throughout the 1600 day, again, very likely, duration of Judgment Day, this prolonged period of time. And he did so by bringing about a spiritual judgment, and those that are not spiritual, that is, they're carnal, they're fleshly, they're not born again, they cannot perceive it, which, of course, will lead to them denying it, refusing it, and turning from the, the doctrine of Christ, the doctrine of the Bible. And while others that are spiritual begin to see it, begin to trust God's word or continue to trust in the doctrines of Christ, the word of God. And, and so they are enduring to the end. The, the rest are not enduring. We see here um, that Moses delayed and during the delay, the Israelites failed their test and God brought further judgment on them. Now, the, the word delay in Luke 12, where the servant says in his heart, my Lord has delayed his coming, is the same Greek word that we find in Hebrews 10 in verse um, uh, 36 and 37. It says, For you have need of patience, that after you have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. The word tarry is 5594 in Strong's Concordance, the same word translated as delay in Luke 12. And, and so he that will come will come and will not tarry. Now this is pulled from Habakkuk in the Old Testament. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 3, where it says, For the vision is yet for, for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie, though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Now the, the pronoun um, should be translated he rather than it, which greatly helps our understanding, but at the end, he shall speak and not lie, though he tarry, wait for him, because he will surely come, he will not tarry. Now, how is that possible that though he tarry, he will not tarry? Or though he delay, he will not delay. And there's only one possible scenario that answers this. May 21, 2011, seemingly Christ tarried. Though he came with spiritual judgment, he will complete the judgment on the last day. Again, in all likelihood, October 7th, 2015, he will not tarry. It, it, there is no tarrying involved at all. It's all part of his overall plan for judgment of this world. Thanks for joining us for eBible Fellowship's Evening Bible Studies. You can hear these studies Monday through Friday over Pal Talk, Skype, eBible Fellowship's webcast audio, or over your phone. For more information or to hear other studies, visit www.ebiblefellowship.com. Until our next study, may the Lord's perfect will be done.